Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Hatch. I'm a vice president with Capgemini. I'm responsible for our enterprise cloud platforms here in North America. And I'm privileged to share the stage today with uh, Sean Kanaf. He's a director of global architecture services at McDonald's. And what we're going to talk to you about today is how McDonald's is leveraging microservices to do two things. One, transform their digital platform, and two, provide a better customer experience in their restaurants and for their customers globally. Sean, thanks for joining the stage with me today. Yep, thank you, Jason. Yeah. So before we get started, let me just provide a little bit of context. So in 2017, Capgemini was selected by McDonald's as one of their strategic partners to embark on a new journey with them. And what we're asked to do is help them develop, deploy, and design a new global e-commerce and digital platform that was to increase digital agility and through microservices um, provide a better customer experience at the restaurants, as I've said before. Um, along in partnership with AWS, we've been working on this for the last two years. And Sean, this is not the first time we've told this story at reInvent for McDonald's. Three years ago, you guys were up on stage and shared the first iteration of this, where in a time of four months, we went from concept to deployment, so an idea to production of a new home delivery service based on ECS. So yep. what are you going to tell us about today? Yeah, so we have a similar story today, um, but at a much larger scale. So, uh, yep, thanks, Jason. Like, like you said, I'm Sean Knaff uh, with McDonald's. Uh, the area of my focus is on customer and restaurant technology, uh, and I'm privileged to work with an amazingly talented group of solution architects, uh, and I'm not just saying that because there's a bunch of them up in the front rows here staring at me, um, and also a bunch of talented people with their partners at Capgemini to help to, uh, bring these uh, ideas and architectures to life in production. So. Um, a couple years ago, yeah, one of my lead architects, Manjiva, and my now VP, uh, Talina, were up here talking about the home delivery project. Uh, and that was a, it was a great use case. Uh, it, was, it was an isolated application, um, very tight timelines, and we were really kind of forced uh, to leverage cloud-native design, DevOps, and automation, and we really used that to, to showcase what we could do with it. Um, and that team is still very successful today. That's a, a fairly autonomous development team pushing their changes into production, um, still using automation, still using DevOps. Uh, and because of that, they've been able to scale that solution into 20 markets uh, since it went live. So they're now in 20 different countries. Uh, and because of the microservice and container-based architecture, the decoupled architecture, uh, they've also integrated it with 18 delivery providers uh, across the world. Um, you know, minimal impact to customers and, uh, and no outage uh, upgrades and things like that. So that's been very successful. What we did was we took that success story, uh, and it was interesting hearing Andy Tuesday talk about uh, kind of one of the first things he talked about was getting the leadership alignment and the buy-in. Uh, and that's really what we used that project for. Um, we, you know, it was a completely different way of doing architecture, development, and certainly deployment. Um, and there was a lot of hesitation uh, to use some of the cloud-native things. First, we had an e-commerce platform. It was an SOA-based architecture. It was a good architecture, very scalable. It was in AWS, um, but it was bundled together at the deploy layer. It was bundled together at the database layer and the messaging layer. So we really couldn't move as fast as we wanted to move um, on those customer-facing applications, right? Where we got the marketing team wanting to trial and error things, and they want to move new features in. Um, it was a highly scalable architecture, but we were not able to deploy fast enough. So uh, the main principle that we went after, two main principles, was independently deployable uh, services, independently scalable services, um, so that we could decrease the blast radius when we did upgrades and, and new feature deployments. We get those deployed uh, with no impact to customers, so no outage upgrades. Um, and we do that with containers based on the, the work we did with the home delivery uh, containers and Kubernetes and Docker allowed us to, to be able to do that functionality. So that's what we went after. Um, yeah, happy to say that in May, we started that deployment in the US. Uh, and we're now you know, fully live. We did a Canary release. We're fully live. As of August 1st, 100% of US customers were uh, transacting on the global mobile application. So the mobile app that you might use to do offers uh, and orders with McDonald's, is, all those transactions are being carried across to Amazon, Kubernetes, Docker. That's wonderful. So Sean, why don't you share some of the, the complexities of this new digital stack and give us an overview of the architecture that's been deployed? Sure. 
Yeah, the, the complexity of McDonald's really comes uh, from the numbers that you see up on the screen here. So uh, we tend to take problems that would be pretty standard or small uh, and really extrapolate them because of the size of our organization. So uh, making sure that we design solutions that can be adopted by 120 different markets is, a, is an absolute challenge. Uh, and that's why things need to be you know, highly configurable, scalable. Um, scalable, we see the number of transactions that we do in our restaurants on a, on a daily basis, 64 million transactions. Uh, our business wants to drive a lot more of that through the digital channels, uh, so we need to make sure that our applications are scaling. Uh, the numbers that we have all of our teams working to achieve is, is a 250,000 uh, API requests per minute target uh, when we're doing the performance testing. Um, but yeah, 37,000 restaurants, it's just scale is, is where, what drives a lot of the complexity in everything that we do. So things that, you know, smaller, smaller app teams, like the, the, the home delivery project to start, don't have to deal with, uh, we have to deal with on a daily basis. In terms of the architecture, um, McDonald's gets a little nervous anytime we start putting nuts and bolts about how we do things up here, but uh, I definitely wanted to show uh, at least an illustrative view of, of how we've positioned the microservices both within our e-commerce stack uh, and also within AWS to give you guys an idea of what we went through. Uh, the complexity that we, we faced was a lot within the tools VPC and it really was because it was all net new tooling uh, to, to carry out this DevOps, uh, the automation, the test automation we wanted to do. Uh, we work with Capgemini had to go through selecting the right tools. Um, as you can see, we, we, we placed our code in binary repositories, configuration management, secrets management, uh, test automation tools, pipelines, uh, log aggregation, APM, Jenkins with DevOps automation, uh, and a whole plethora of security testing tools built into these CI CD pipelines that we'll talk about later. But yeah. um, that was a big piece of the complexity, was just you know, shifting all that new technology into the ecosystem. In terms of the architecture, it's, it's somewhat of a standard architecture at the top of the uh, the diagram there, you see our front end channels. And those are the things today as the global mobile application uh, that is live in many of the markets today. You've got web ordering uh, in some of the European and Asian markets. And we've got uh, the MIC delivery uh, with our you know, integrations with our delivery partners. Uh, and then what we've built this solution as is really being able to add new channels uh, across you know, the same sets of services. So really building a core set of services that can service uh, any number of new channels, because I think that's one of the things that McDonald's wants to look at is uh, how can we increase the number of ways that we engage with our customers and allow them to order uh, McDonald's food with us. So that, uh, that experience layer is, is happening within the middleware. So we've, uh, we've built out an experience layer, process layer, and optional system layer. The experience layer is what we're using to provide a consistent um, behavior uh, across the different channels and transform some things that, uh, and responses that those channels might need tweaked without creating a lot of churn in the services underneath of it. Uh, all the communication comes through uh, that middleware. Prior to getting there, it's going through CDN uh, and some API protection tools and things like that. Uh, it leaves the middleware layer heading into our services layer through uh, Amazon ALB, uh, and that's where it then starts to interact with our uh, Kubernetes cluster. So in our US, we've got a five master node cluster up and running. We've got about 70 pods uh, spread across three availability zones. Uh, 70 fluctuates uh, depending on the traffic, uh, so we're using the, all of the auto scale features within Kubernetes. Um, also using it to, to be able to deploy new Docker containers in there with zero downtime. Uh, so that's, those have been huge benefits. Um, you can see in here there's so, still some EC2 instances. So there's a few services that we still run on EC2. That was really around just, uh, we had to hit timelines, because uh, we, we, we'll discuss, uh, it was tied to some pretty major business initiatives. Uh, and there's a couple of services that we just thought were too risky to try to force them into a container-based, but uh, happy to say that they are, have plans to be container-based in production by the first half of next year as well. So looking to get everything running on those do Docker containers. Currently, we're managing the Docker containers, so they're, they're on AWS, uh, but we're managing with the KOps control plane, um, and we're not leveraging EKS yet. You see it up there in the diagram because, uh, you know, and certainly some of the conversations we're having this week, uh, we are eager to see how we can leverage EKS uh, and remove some of the complexity around managing Kubernetes ourselves uh, with our partners, Capgemini, really having them focus on developing feature functionalities where uh, I'd prefer them to spend their time. So leveraging as much of the serverless things as possible is, is what we're looking to do. Um, the graph gets a little bit busy if I show you how all of the services interact with various Amazon tools, but as you can see, a list down there is, uh, is some of what we use on a, on a, a large scale basis. We're using a lot of Lambda where we replaced a lot of our batch functionality to trigger jobs and things like that. 
uh, if we need to maintain state through any of those jobs, we're leveraging step functions along with those. Um, a lot of the service-to-service -service communication uh, with the Kubernetes is across SQS. Um, we're leveraging S3 for a lot of integration layers uh, with other platforms or systems within McDonald's. Some of the services are leveraging Elastic Cache. Uh, a lot of services using Elasticsearch, like our EOK stack, as well as some of our location services. Uh, leveraging Aurora, Dynamo uh, for, for the databases, because it was just much easier to connect to those, get them up and running. Uh, and what you don't see in this graph is also a lot of our data and analytics platforms. Uh, and you know, kind of outside of the, the scope of the Capgemini agreement, they're also going through a similar digital transformation with their vendors, and yeah. they've got an architecture. We're feeding that uh, architecture with Kinesis um, to get them the data that they need for all the analytics uh, and machine learning and things like that. And then you see some of the third-party integration. So uh, we integrate with some uh, third-party marketing and campaign management systems, some loyalty provider systems, and authentication and social media integrations to, to, to get these business drivers that we talk about completed. And this architecture is either replicated or will be replicated for each of your major markets globally? Great question, yeah, so I, I missed the fact. So this environment is built in North America, it's built in Europe, and it's built in Asia Pacific. Uh, so we're running out of three of those regions spread across three AZs within each of those. So uh, like I said, we're live in the US, uh, live in Germany with a, with a loyalty pilot. Uh, so they, they just completed their pilot there uh, and look into the Australian and Asia Pacific regions next to start migrating going live as well. Very good. So. Obviously, scale has its own challenges when we're, we're talking about this. Can you share with our audience today some of the challenges we faced and had to overcome with building a platform from scratch, and maybe what are some of the lessons learned that we should take away? Sure. Yeah, so I, I bucket the challenges into kind of two main areas. You have actual technical challenges uh, and engineering challenges. Those are the fun ones, and those are the ones that are, um, you know, for the people in this room and, and for us are, are typically easy to solve. Uh, so I'll skip those, I'll come back later. <laughs> the engineering process, uh, more of the process procedure standards, uh, especially at the scale of McDonald's and the Capgemini team that we partner with, that uh, is where the real challenges come in place, right? You've got over a thousand developers spread across literally every corner of the globe. Um, when you're talking about a CI CD pipeline, you're talking about co-branching strategies, uh, what we found was all the teams were doing it differently uh, and varying levels of, of maturity within all those teams. So, uh, really getting the teams aligned on, on core pieces of technology that we knew we needed uh, to have a cohesive solution that we could, you know, ultimately our goal is to be able to deploy new feature and functionality every two weeks into this system, all the way into production. Um, and to have these tight pipelines and things in place, everything orchestrated, and especially the testing, uh, you have to have those standards in place. So that was a big challenge. Uh, Trunk-based development is one. Uh, so we had, all teams were doing different uh, styles of, of code branching. So. Uh, what we're working with Capgem is really pushing trunk-based development uh, so that we can, if we identify issues, we can quickly get those fixed and merged and put through the environments and through the pipelines uh, and get brought out to production. And that everybody's kind of following that same process to make sure things go into production co in a cohesive manner. Uh, continuous deployment, continuous integration, continuous deployment, again, all the teams had varying levels of uh, maturity in those areas. Uh, very few of them were doing them the same way. So, really getting a, a CICD pipeline put in place. So we'll show the diagram about a little bit later here, but um, that was a challenge, right? Trying to get everybody on the same board. And really, it's just about upskilling those teams, making sure they understand really why are we trying to do this, uh, and then getting the tools and the training that they need to be successful within the ecosystem. Um, that's where we spent a lot of our time, you know, between us and with Capgemini to, to work through getting those standards in place, just massive amounts of communication and alignment with those teams to make sure that across the world they were all firing on the same cylinder. Um, complexity and tooling uh, as well. So it's Thursday, I assume everybody's already been down to the expo. Um, and you can just walk around, you can see it's just a massive amount of platforms, tools, accelerators, uh, a lot of cool stuff out there, but it also makes our job extremely difficult in choosing what's gonna be right for you and which use cases and which teams. Of course, every team comes to the table with a tool that they used last time, and they want to use that. Um, McDonald's is very big. Unfortunately, they won't let me license all of those. So uh, we had to you know, really come down to what tools we're going to be successful with. So that, that was a lot of complexity as well. The other piece is supportability uh, and transparency. So 
uh, as we move into the microservices, that's a, that's a big challenge, making sure that we're still monitoring at the same level. So with the SOA-based architecture, we, we had a very uh, cohesive uh, and full monitoring platform, log management with the EOK stack. Uh, we are using monitoring in New Relic, but um, we had a good end-to-end -end even on the mobile apps and things like that. So as we moved into microservices, that all breaks apart, and you've got to really remap how you start doing that monitoring and analytics pieces to, to make sure you're getting the same metrics and you're identifying issues quickly. So there's a little bit of complexity and challenge to that, but we work with the teams um, and always constantly evolving and improving the, the monitoring area as well. Going back to the technical challenges, um, I think we run into a lot of the same challenges anybody's going to run into. Uh, challenges specific to, to decomposing a, a legacy app is really understanding and making good decisions about what level you're going to decompose those services. So uh, it, it's very easy when you're building net new, and there's a lot of net new services built in here, but uh, for things that are already existing, it's really looking at what's the right way to pull those out of the existing system into an independently deployable and independently scalable service. Um, that presented some challenges because you, know, you don't want to go too far and make things overly complex. Uh, you get tangled into a web of things like distributed transactions and things like that. Um, so we, we went about it with the strangulation pattern, really, right? looking at what are the highest priority things that we know are going to change and fluctuate in production, that we know the business is going to change, things around offer types, offer templates, and making sure that we are able to independently deploy and iterate on that. Um, so really looked at prioritizing which things we thought were going to have the most fluctuation and going after uh, pulling those into microservices. Uh, back pressure control. Uh, so we, we had some, some fun uh, scenarios with that. Uh, and that's just in terms of you know, managing, uh, making sure the services are playing nice with each other uh, in, the, in the ecosystem, right? So if a, service, if a service or a pod goes down, making sure that the other services or the, the app isn't pounding on, on everything else. Uh, so working through uh, how we're managing some of the uh, circuit breaker logics, exponential backoffs, making sure that all the teams are handling that uh, in a consistent manner and that everybody is addressing it uh, and everybody's playing nice within the microservices ecosystem. Uh, in, in that same vein, uh, service isolation, making sure that uh, we have clean boundaries around what those services are doing um, uh, in terms of even in deploys and then also in the transactional nature of those uh, and making sure that we have item potency across the services, uh, making sure that they're handling that within there. Uh, and then just overall uh, service reliability, right? So, Really, uh, we, we work with Capgemini on the test automation uh, and you know, positive test cases, negative test cases, getting everything automated as much as possible um, because I think that's, that's one of our, our biggest things is if we want to move fast, we have to make sure that those test processes are in, in, in place that we're able to, to test, automate, and get them moved into production much faster. The other one was around, or last point uh, around the, the challenges was around right sizing. So our previous stack, We'd done a, a lot of performance testing and a lot of production experience with it. So we knew exactly what we needed uh, for what volumes of transactions. And McDonald's transactions uh, tend to peak very high at lunch. Uh, and again, not quite as high, but almost as high at dinner time. And then they drop very low at the middle of the night. Uh, but we now do have 24-hour restaurants all over the world. Uh, so it's a constant cycle. Um, and what we did previously is we just built to max capacity. Um, we, we didn't leverage a lot of auto scale, even though we were in AWS. Um, there was just a little bit too much risk in some of the timing around it, so uh, we built to max. This one, uh, as we talk about you know, cost savings and efficiencies, we wanted to make sure that we right-size these environments and leverage as much of the auto-scale uh, opportunities as that we could. So that was another fun challenge to really performance tune uh, and then in production tune with the Canary release, where do we need to be at uh, at full scale? Wonderful. So, uh, Sean, when, when you and I talk and when I talk to our team on the ground, it's very apparent that McDonald's views this microservices pl platform as a foundational component of de delivering better business value and better agility. So could you maybe share with us some of the, the business drivers and initiatives that, that were considered and, and put in place to support this type of digital transformation for your organization? I can do that. Thank you. I'd hope so. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, McDonald's is a burger company, right? Uh, I don't think any you know, senior leadership at McDonald's is asking for microservices. So uh, you really need to strategically find out how are you going to tie a, a massive architecture shift like this. It's a, it's a large investment. 
um, again, getting the leadership buy-in you know, at the IT level and making sure they're getting the buy-in at the business level uh, is key to that. Um, the other trick is obviously to tie it to some very uh, critical business initiatives. So that's what we did. Uh, we tied it to, in the US, one of the big initiatives of 2019 was personalized offers. Uh, so if any of you used the McDonald's mobile app, starting around August, you probably started seeing offers that were saying only for you. Uh, so that's a personalized offer uh, and using you know, some machine learning and marketing segments and things to, to really start focusing the marketing dollars to the people that they think are gonna best leverage those. Uh, so it was a marketing play. Uh, also the loyalty platform, so revamping and building a new loyalty platform with McDonald's. Uh, that piloted in Germany, uh, and we leveraged the exact same stack, the exact same microservices, uh, because that's the whole point of this, is reuse. Um, we, using that same stack, we also went and built out the Germany loyalty pilot uh, with the same ecosystem. Uh, and that, uh, that pilot's uh, up, up and running in, in Germany right now, uh, looking to expand on that as well. Uh, integrated delivery improvements, so Mc, McDonald's delivery went live. That was one of the first things we talked about a couple years ago. Uh, and they're just continuously enhancing the, the user experience for that. That was also one of the business drivers that, that we leveraged this ecosystem for. So those are the things that we tied uh, this transformation to in terms of the technology. Uh, and the way that we sold it was really around agility, right? Uh, we knew that you know, the common theme across those initiatives that I just spoke about was that they're customer facing and that they're marketing driven. Uh, so I don't know how many people have worked with the marketing teams directly, um, but my personal experience is that they tend to change their minds quite a bit. Um, and to their point, they want to be able to quickly iterate on ideas, see if they're getting the uplift they want. And if the, if the idea is uh, good, they want to be able to push that onto production. If the idea is bad, uh, they want to roll it back and try something else. And we just didn't have the, the ability to do that with the, with the previous stack. So this, that was a, a key business driver, is just the agility uh, and ability to rapidly iterate on on features and functionality. So that's, that's what we're aiming for with that piece. Another piece is around cost efficiency. Uh, like I said, we had previously built our platforms for max capacity. We don't always use max capacity, obviously not a best cloud practice. So really starting to take advantage of things like serverless and auto scale within AWS and within Kubernetes uh, to try to drive a more cost efficient architecture. So that was one of the business drivers and one of the things that we were selling uh, to leadership to, to allow us to get this done. Um, the other one is, uh, you know, I mentioned the data and analytics platform. So really starting to get better, more consistent, more accurate data uh, out of these services and out of you know, the, the customer interactions and the restaurant interactions fed to those data platforms so they can um, you know, do all the magic that they're here and you know, talking to all the machine learning people and, and data science people so they can work their magic on it and then drive that back into marketing to make better decisions around customer behavior, marketing, promotions, things, like, things of that nature. So, a lot of it was around getting better, more accurate, more real-time data to those platforms as well. Wonderful. So we've spent the last three and a half days seeing all these new features, uh, services that are now available or coming available. Now, as the, the architect for this, this platform, what are some of these emerging trends and new technologies and offerings that you're seeing? And what's the plan to start incorporating them into future deployments and releases? Sure. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about, mostly because I want to show off what, what the team's built for us, but uh, it's not a, not a new technology trend, but it's automation, right? Yeah. So one of the, the main things around uh, what we did was we wanted to drive DevOps and automation, uh, automation of the infrastructure, automation of the testing, automation of the, the deployments into production. So what you see here is something we've worked very hard with Capgemini on uh, and having this delivered uh, and demoed to leadership just in the last couple of weeks here is uh, now that we're live, really optimizing the CICD pipeline to fully automate what we call a McDonald's, um, and our VP has jokingly received a big red button on his desk, uh, is the push button deploys. So literally the ability to, at any point, push a button, instantiate an environment in any area of the world, any of the regions in AWS, run our tests on it, and then be able to deprecate it or leave it up for more user uh, UAT testing, things like that. So what you see up, up here in the yellow boxes is really how you define what those environments are going to be, right? It's collecting the data uh, around the infrastructure, collecting the configurations of the apps, collecting the configurations uh, for all of the markets. Uh, and that's a challenge in McDonald's just because of the complexity that I talked about earlier. Um, but the important thing here is, is collecting it in code, right? Putting it into Git, um, checking it in, um, and having it all code-based and versioned in your code repositories. That was a key piece of that. 
once these are executing the pipelines, uh, it's going through, it's building out the actual Jenkins jobs in the pipelines. It's taking those configuration files, flattening it out, putting it into console, which is what we're using for configuration management across all these microservices. Um, it then starts to provision the infrastructure. So we're leveraging Terraform for all of the infrastructure uh, in AWS uh, and Kubernetes. That instantiates all of, all of those pieces. Uh, it then goes and starts to deploy the code, the containers, or the code onto the EC2 uh, instances. With ter with, uh, well, that's with whatever you know, process that those dev teams or those product teams have defined, so they have some autonomy there as well. Uh, we're then running infrastructure tests uh, on what we built with Terraform, making sure that what Terraform built is exactly what we told it to, uh, and that all the configuration values that were pulled from are what got set up. Uh, we're doing the test data load so that we'll be ready for testing. We're doing a smoke test against the APIs, essentially just lighting all the APIs up, making sure they, they respond. Uh, and then we move to the next thing is where we're running some of our key critical business flows. And these could be things like uh, redeem and offer, create and redeem and offer, uh, and maybe place a mobile order. Um, kind of one of the next phases is, is that's the area of focus next is where we're looking to really uh, improve and increase the coverage of that test automation at the functional and regression layer so that we can run, run more and more of, of those flows in, in step eight here. Um, to the point where ideally we want to be at like 85% coverage to be able to do all of our regression testing with automation. And we feel that that's going to speed up our test cycles in McDonald's, especially um, when you have to go to 120 markets and they all want to make sure that they're testing their use cases. What I'm saying is I want them to all give us your use cases, let's script them and put them into this system so that we can run them all through here. So that's the plan. We're also doing some of the performance testing at the component level uh, and all the security testing. Um, that's being run in this place, uh, both inside, out, and from the outside in at this. So, so um, automation is one of those big trends. Um, again, not a new one, but uh, I was, I was you know, really happy what the teams did around this and a lot of hard work, so I definitely wanted to show that off today. Uh, the other trends, uh, certainly IoT, you're hearing a lot about. Uh, in McDonald's with IoT, we've always had a big uh, you know, IoT space within our restaurants. If, with any company that has point of sale, you've got a bunch of IoT devices in the restaurant. Uh, but just recently in the last few years, obviously you're seeing a lot of technology uh, and a lot of ability to now do more with that, with those IoT devices. So uh, starting to get more intelligent devices in the restaurant to, to help us streamline and, and optimize our restaurant efficiencies. Um, that's certainly a goal that we're, we're looking at. Uh, McDonald's has actually stood up an IoT role within McDonald's uh, that's gonna focus on IoT platform. Um, and they have uh, you know, teams and vendors that they're working on in that space as well. Uh, Artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, that's obviously another area that uh, seems to be pretty popular in the hallways here. Um, and what, uh, what McDonald's is doing with that, if anyone's followed McDonald's at all, uh, you've probably seen we've made a couple pretty big acquisitions this year, uh, and those are very much around the machine learning space. So uh, a decisioning engine logic uh, that we're using to optimize drive-through experience uh, and looking at drive-through, kiosk, mobile app, providing recommendations and, and things with, with that sort of a service, looking at third party, uh, known and unknown data with our customer. Another one was around voice, uh, voice ordering. So really looking to improve voice ordering accuracy and speed of service in the drive-throughs, uh, looking at could we leverage that in kiosk and, and our, in our mobile app, and really work. You know, we see that as being a big play and the future is, is voice ordering. So uh, that was another one of those big moves. Uh, and then just a lot of, uh, more around the stuff that we're you know, keeping up with AWS, right? So we come down here, this is an exciting time of year for us to learn what, is, uh, what are the new things that we're gonna look at. Um, and I was really pumped to hear a lot about the EKF uh, stuff that, uh, that we're hearing about, some of the Fargate things, eager to see how that could play into this. Um, some of the managed nodes uh, offerings that they announced at uh, KubeCon. Um, so really looking at how we could take advantage of some of the EKS uh, and also going, you know, looking more at a lot of the serverless technology as well. So those are all areas that we're looking at. So Sean, prior to push button deploy, how long did it take us to launch an environment? Um, <laughs> it depended on where we were at uh, and, and you know, what phase, but from, from ground zero, it was months. Yeah. So it took us months, a couple months probably to get uh, from, you know, from the VPCs and the networking and all those pieces to the infrastructure within the, uh, those accounts um, to the apps deployed and tested, it was months. Uh, and this pipeline now runs within a few hours. I believe they're doing it in about six, seven hours right now, the whole thing. Which is incredible. And all that's not just 
technology enabling that. There's lots of governance and process around that yes. as well that's making that happen. Yep, all the challenges that we talked about earlier went into this uh, uh, and that's why, that's why I wanted to show it. You know, it's certainly a lot of hard work by some of the people in the crowd here today, so yep. I'm very happy with that. Wonderful. Okay, so we're now live in North America. We're, we're launching a pilot in, or we're live with a pilot now in Germany. What's the business value that our, our constituents and our stakeholders are, are starting to realize from this platform? Sure. So I have, the way I see it, I have two customers, right? One is my business partners. So these are like the, you know, the, the IT strategy groups or the, the business strategy groups, the marketing groups, um, restaurant operations groups. So uh, for those customers, you know, the immediate value is really being able to iterate fast on things, uh, to ha rapidly hypothesize a new functionality, to, to get it into production, see if it provides the value that they thought it was going to. If so, push 100% you know, to production. If not, roll back, try again with something new. So it's just you know, really around agility uh, and speed to market for those, um, for those customers. Uh, for the McDonald's consumers and those of the people coming to the restaurants to, to you know, eat our food, um, it's really just a more modern and evolving digital experience. So we'll, we'll be able to get, you know, there's a whole pipeline of ideas that our digital teams have that we want to be able to open that pipeline up and, and allow them to get those in front of our customers. So I think with these microservices and this architecture and the DevOps patterns, we're going to start seeing a, a lot more rapidly evolving digital experience. At least that's our, that's our hope. Uh, and from the architecture side, that's, that was our goal. More personalized experiences as well. So I mentioned the personalized offers. Uh, I mentioned the loyalty program. So these are two marketing plays with McDonald's where uh, they're looking to, to just have a more personalized engagement with our customers uh, in terms of getting them better offers for what they like uh, and also rewarding people that are um, their frequent customers. The other one is, is reliability, right? So no more you know, outages between 12 to one if we had to do a, an upgrade. Um, being able to do upgrades, zero downtime, uh, and be able to push these things out every two weeks is really a goal that we're going after. So a more reliable uh, and consistent uh, experience as well. Very good. So anytime we're talking about customer experience and customer data, we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss security and the importance of that in this environment. Um, why don't you just share with us how we've embedded that in and around the platform? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Mix, yeah McDonald's takes security absolutely very seriously. Uh, so yeah, it's important to say that we actually have an entire organization, the Global Technology Risk Management Group, um, that handles a lot of the policy and procedures and things that, that we need to follow. We partner closely with them to make sure that my solution architects know exactly what those policies are and that those translate into non-functional requirements for any of the app teams that are building services with McDonald's. We also uh, work with the global GTRM team uh, to provide threat model training. So uh, all of my architects now are trained in threat modeling uh, and they're using that with the Capgemini resources and with the development teams uh, and with the business as we go through the solutioning and blueprinting phase. Threat modeling is really just a consistent framework to look at um, as you're designing a solution, identifying where the risks are, uh, prioritizing what those risks are making sure that they're identified, logged, and tracked, making sure that we're creating tests for those and that the output of those get put into the CI-CD pipeline, and that we also have monitors and things uh, for any of those as well. So you know, a big push with threat modeling, uh, we see that as, as a uh, successful way to, to look at security across all these services that we're building as opposed to losing control. You know, I think there's a, there's a risk of that as you break into microservices. You can have teams going off and doing a bunch of crazy stuff. Uh, McDonald's is very much not uh, allowing that, so using this as a framework to, to kind of track that. Each product team is then responsible for making sure that within their CICD pipelines, those rules from the output of the threat modeling are built into the, uh, the test cases. Uh, and we consider that some of the inside out testing. Uh, and then as those environments are built and deployed, we do a series of outside in testing, right? Vulnerability scanning, penetration testing, uh, and then a lot of uh, areas around API protection for anything that's publicly exposed in our APIs. Uh, and then just the continuous monitoring uh, of the production environments, uh, and making sure you have an incident response plans, making sure that the teams know what they're looking for and can identify any sorts of security potential threats and issues uh, as we're going along. <laughs> McDonald's is huge, right? We go back to 120 countries. We have to account for you know, 120 countries, federal laws, municipal laws, local laws. That always drives a lot of complexity, but that's also something that, that falls on my team and GTRM to make sure that we're considering all of those as we design solutions for the, for the markets. I guess, Sean, one final question. What are some of the new cool enhancements and features and customer experiences we're going to be rolling out on this platform in the coming months? Sure. I'm not allowed to talk about any of that. 
<laughs> now, I could talk about, you know, certainly some of the things that are within the scope of this platform. Um, you know, a lot of things I'm not allowed to talk about, but some of the things that have been announced to you. A lot of focus uh, on our drive through so optimization of the drive through Speed of service in the drive through is key at McDonald's. Uh, in the U.S. especially, I, I want to say it's about 73% of our uh, U.S. transactions are through the drive through um, So we're really optimizing that speed, making sure we're getting cars through, not, not stopping cars and parking cars. So we're also trying to do a lot of new feature and functionality within the drive through um, you know, the voice ordering, things like that. We want to make sure that anything we're doing there is not slowing down the drive through in any, any space. So that's uh, there'll be a lot of focus on drive through and things there. Uh, again, more around personalization, and that's what this stack is really uh, servicing is you know, personalized offers, loyalty programs. So those are all things certainly to look out for. Um, the loyalty platform is probably the one that I'm excited about. Uh, I'm also a customer quite a bit of, of my company, so uh, my kids and I uh, enjoy that. Uh, restaurant technology, so I, I mentioned a couple spaces. We have other teams that are focusing on restaurant efficiency using IoT, uh, and AIML to try to drive a lot of restaurant efficiency. So uh, we see a lot of uh, work in that space as well. Uh, and then also a smoother, revamped, uh, integrated delivery, make delivery process. So they're always looking to make that customer experience smoother uh, and less friction. So those are the main things that, this, that the scope of this project is, uh, is servicing. Okay. Well, Sean, first and foremost, thank you for sharing this story with us today. We appreciate it. Um, and I know there's probably some questions from the audience. Um, I know based on McDonald's policies, we're, we're not allowed to take those questions on mic, but we're happy to come to the side of the stage and have those sure. conversations with you all. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, two things. You know. We can, we can handle the questions, I'm happy to talk about it. I know me and the guys are, are you know, thrilled to talk about this stuff with you, but yeah, they don't typically do the open mic stuff. So um, yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for everybody who came here to, to listen to us, and thanks for your interest in our story. Uh, certainly happy to you know, catch, me, catch me off the stage or catch me outside of here, and uh, hopefully I can help answer your questions. If not, I'll find a smarter guy in the, in the crowd with me that can answer, so. Great, thank you all. <laughs>